So today we are going to look at Luke chapter 17. This is uh, got a couple tough parts to it, but we will uh, we'll take a look at it and see how it goes. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone though or through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and, plant, and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready to wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank his servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we lift our hearts and our minds up to you. For those who are watching online and for those who are uh, just at home, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit, that these words might speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so there's a couple rough parts here on this passage, and we're going to just kind of explore some of them. Uh, the, the first thing that we see is that Jesus says plainly, clearly, very easily, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. Has anybody ever, ever been going forward in life and then something over there turns them off to the side a little bit? Too many times. Uh, so sometimes it's not just a little, oh, it's over there, but it's a whoop. And we're, we're just pulled. We're, we're, we're just, oh. Sometimes these, we realize things that cause us to stumble are bound to come. Now, me, things regularly cause me to stumble because I don't always pick my feet high enough. My wife, she is a self-proclaimed clumsy, uh, she said I'm, I'm clumsy. That's kind of where she is. Just, everything happens because I'm clumsy. So she walks in, she bumps her side, she drops something, she spills it. She, she, she says I'm clumsy. And so for her, she's banging her toe all the time. She's like, things are bound to come to cause me to stumble. And Jesus says it clearly. So that's comforting, right? How do I get past this? Jesus here is not worried about the things that are bound to come. He's more concerned with those who bring it to you. <clears throat> sometimes things happen, but some of you have that person in your life who leads you down that path. Some of you have that little voice that they're the one who's always offering you something to get you off the straight and narrow. Some of you have a good plan, and there's that one friend of yours, that one family member, that one person, who, if you're alone with them for too long, you're going to wake up strapped to the front of a car somewhere without any clothes on, dress, yeah. dressed up in mayonnaise. I don't know how that's ever happened, but I've heard it before. Some people have had some interesting experiences when they've gone away with somebody and something happened and they can't remember what. Maybe you are that friend. Maybe you have that friend. But woe to you to bring those little ones to stumble. It would be better for that person to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck. Now, what's a millstone? So for those of you who are unaware, 
A millstone is this big wheel made of stone. It's got a hole poked in the middle of it, and it's got a spoke. And then what happens is there's another stone that's laid flat, and they put grain on this. And then you either have an animal or a person walks around in a circle, pushing this wheel around and around, and as it grinds up the various forms of grain in the mill, and as a result of that, they're able to get bread or other forms of food. But these things are gigantic stones. Similarly, this would be like Jesus saying, it would be better for this person to be found by the mafia and to be given cement boots. Maybe some of you are familiar with that term. But Jesus says very clearly, so watch yourselves. Now this is a challenging part because some of us have led others towards sin. And Jesus is saying it'd be better for you to be tossed into the sea. Now, I'll tell you this. You may have led someone astray, but Jesus offers hope because it's if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. What? Tell them no! Okay. But if they repent, forgive them. This is rough. Because now we ask the question, is it true repentance? Or is it just lip service? Because some people will say, I'm sorry. Just because they want to avoid punishment. Okay, think about it for a second. You're pulled over, perhaps, by the police. And the police comes and taps on your window, license and registration. You roll your window down that far, and you slip it up through the window. Try to look the other way, try to be incognito. Now, this is obvious. So when I get pulled over, there's, there's no escaping. If I've done something wrong, and I want to go and take this officer to, or to fight the ticket, they will easily remember, oh, that was the guy. So my, my, my hope is, if there's ever a problem, I need to quickly shave my beard and probably cut my hair, and I'd show up, he's like, I don't recognize that guy. No, I don't think I gave him a ticket. <laughs> Try to skirt the system. The more regular you look, the better chance you have, if you decide to fight a ticket. Nothing stands out. Now, if you're the guy who's belligerent, who's spitting at the officer, who's trying to film things, they can start to remember some of these things. I don't know. But you've given your registration and license to the police. They look at you and say, do you know why I pulled you over? Nope, but I'm sorry. That's good enough. Go on your way. Has that ever happened? No. <laughs> but I mean, in a situation like this, this is what's happening. If they repent, forgive them. Now, if we look at the definition of repent, uh, it, it's often going in one direction and then going the opposite way. So, I mean, the, the definition of repent is to literally turn from what you are doing. So one would say, if they repent, forgive them. Now, here it doesn't say, I'm sorry. Here they're making some sort of a statement and they're turning from their wicked ways. Um, I'm going to use an analogy here, and I first don't want to make anyone feel condemned. I don't want anyone to feel that I'm speaking about them. And I'm just going to use an example that is easy to follow, but I'm willing to bet that we can substitute what I'm going to talk about, and many of us would fall in. So people who are an addict to a controlled substance, and we're, we're going to pick on heroin for a second, okay? Now, some people are addicted to other things. Coffee, uh, alcohol, cigarettes. We're not going to condemn anything here. We're, we're making the statement, even work. There's a person who is addicted to something. They go one direction, 
They fall down the hole. They get themselves up. And they turn their life around. And then they fall back down in the hole. They turn their life around. And they fall back down in the hole. And sometimes it's an issue of personal decision. Sometimes it's a result of the company in which they keep. Sometimes it's a result of just the stash that they have, and every time they go to throw it away, well, one more hit's not going to hurt. There is a stigma for people who have used drugs. And one of the things that the challenge on, on all addictive behaviors is when you have a cycle, break the cycle. And it's easy for me up here to say that. There are people who are addicted to various games. Two hours later, life has passed them by because they've been playing a game for five minutes. Mm -hmm. There are people who are addicted to certain television shows and they have no problem binge watching something for 30 hours straight. <laughs> Toothpicks holding their eyes open. <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're focused in. Life has passed them by. Uh, there, there are people who will set certain times of the day aside so that they can do certain things. They're functioning addicts. But we can see an example of a stereotype of people who get hooked on something and after they turn their life around, something or other draws them back. Now, as, as we look at as bad as that might be, the rush people get even be addicted to the word of God can become something that we can understand. And here, this person is fallen into their addiction. They've turned their life around. And then they fell into it again. Seven times in one day. And yet they're repenting. So how, how can they truly repent if in fact they keep going back to it. This is a mystery that I don't know if I'll ever understand completely. Because when you fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But fool me seven times? Yet Jesus is making this statement because I'm going to be honest, not that I've been lying before, uh, but, but if you look at your life and you see the amount of things you've asked God for forgiveness on, he'd look at you and say, mm, why should I forgive you? You just asked forgiveness of this yesterday. Why should I forgive you? You did this. Well, maybe you didn't do that part, but now you do we, we can see that sometimes in our own prayer life, we realize that it's not as easy as it sounds. In fact, some of us are guilty of some of the other sins that Jesus talks about, where if you look at a woman or a man with lust, it's as if you did the deed. If you look at someone and you want to kill them, it's as if you did the deed. So many of us do not have blood on our hands, but we might have blood on our minds. Many of us might not be guilty of, oh, I didn't do that, but we thought it. Sometimes we say it, sometimes we do it, sometimes we think it, and all of those are things in which we need repentance. All of these things in which from repentance we can receive forgiveness. There's not a person here today who has gone their whole life sinless. There's not a person here today who's got it figured out. Because when we look at stuff in the shadows, when we look at the stuff when we're at home, when we look at the whatever, there are things that creep up on us. Now, here's this final part. It says, suppose, well, actually, I'm going to go back. The apostles looked at him and said, I can't do this. Increase our faith. And if Jesus were here today giving this same message, and he was telling it in various ways, and he gave us an example, and we look at this and say, I, 
That's hard. I mean, I'm going to go to your house today and I'm going to break your window. Then I'm going to come and I'm going to apologize. Then I'm going to come and I'm going to break your door. I'm not going to break your door anymore. I'm going to apologize. Then I'm going to come and I'm going to burn your grass. I apologize. I'm never going to do that again. I'm returning to break my life. And then I'm going to write graffiti on your garage. Now, do we see how all of a sudden it's going to be tough for you to forgive me as the day goes on and I continue to do stuff? This makes the challenge all that much harder. And the disciples said, we can't do this. Increase our faith. And Jesus said, if your faith is this small, you can tell this to go from there and do that. Now, I don't know how many of us have the ability to pick up a tree, and maybe Jesus was speaking figuratively, but at the same time, I believe that with faith, faith can move mountains, and in this case here, faith can move mulberry bushes. Remember, Jesus did not have the internet to have his sermons play in perpetuity. Rather, he had voice and crowd, and wherever he went, he sometimes gave the same message. Why? Because it's a new crowd, and the message wasn't a bad one. So he gave it again. But he might change a few of the details, like maybe he was out in the desert, and they had a mountain, so the faith moved the mountain. And then he's walking around, and he tells another example, and well, there's no mountains, but there's a tree here. It's just as impossible, but I'll tell you, with a little bit of faith, you can do a lot. And I firmly believe that all of us, if we had that just little bit of faith. In fact, if our faith was this much more than our doubt, we could do great things. But as we look at this last part, I don't think any of us have slaves at home, do they? Somebody tied up in the basement on a chain. Uh, I don't think we have too many servants, but then again, that's why parents have kids, right? <laughs> but most of the time, People are expected to do their job. Here he says, suppose one of you, and he might be speaking to a rich group of people. But if you have a servant who does their job, you're not going to tell them, come along and sit down and eat next to me. No, you're going to say, keep doing your job. He's going to say, go get supper ready. Do what you're supposed to do. He's not even going to say thank you because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Now, keep in mind, our understanding of the word thank you is different than the biblical understanding of thank you. Thank you means our business is concluded. I will not be dealing with you again. All right. So when people in the Bible say thank you, there is no expectation that they will continue to do business. So if you go to a store and you say, thank you, you're effectively saying, I will no longer be working with you. I'm going to be going over to Vons next week instead yeah. of you. Okay. Um, on that same line, if you have a servant and you tell them, thank you, you're basically releasing them from their obligations. So he, you're not going to say thank you. He's not going to thank the servant because they did not, because they did what they were told to do. Now, in American polite society, when someone does something, you say thank you. The waitress brings you the food, you say thank you. It's polite. Someone opens the door, you say thank you. This is two different types of thank you. But it is something in which to do gratitude. And it does say to give thanks to God. And there's sometimes there's a, a way in which we're saying, okay, God, I want to give thanks to you for this. It's not that I want to cease my dealings with you, but I do want to be able to move forward to the next thing. Because imagine if God gave you a chocolate cake and you ate it. And that's it. You go, it was good. But I bet you you'd love to have another chocolate cake. So you say, thank you, God, for this cake, because you want another one. You don't want it to just sit on your mantle and say, this was the cake that God gave me. I didn't want to say thank you because I wanted to keep the cake. No, sometimes we receive and we enjoy. We bask in the glory of God and we say thank you. 
So then we can move on to the next thing in which we can receive the glory of God and bask in that. How many of us are content? Well, there's a lot of little things we can be content with. But in a general picture, many of us get so satisfied that we no longer move forward. Some of you are happy where you're at in life. So you do just enough to stay there. You don't want to do a little bit extra because that might mean, oh, it might hurt my back in the day. It might get a little sleepy. I don't know. Many of us have this point where we don't want to do any more than we have to do. And that's where Jesus is coming along here. He's saying, you also, when you have done everything you were told to do. So you are not the masters. Yet some people, he starts it off, suppose one of you as a servant. So he starts off with you being the master, but he reminds people again and again, it's not these people who see God, but it's those who humble themselves and put themselves in the form of a servant, then they will understand the blessings of God. And this isn't to say that wealth is a bad thing. This is to say that in order to appreciate it, you have to go from the bottom and work your way up. And if you are already at the top, take a day in the life of the lower people, perhaps in your employees, do what they're doing. See be humble. Jesus washed his own disciples' feet. And so Jesus makes this paradigm shift. He makes you are the servant. And when you have done everything you have been told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And unfortunately, many of us, when we go before God, this will be our response. I am an unworthy servant. I have only done my duty. I have not gone above and beyond. I have not tried to do anything else. I have just done what is asked of me. In the beginning of that, it says plowing or looking after the sheep. The sheep fell off the ledge. I'm not getting paid to go down and get that. Anybody ever have that? I'm not, I'm not paid for that. That's not my job description. Any, anybody ever have that at work? You're asked to do things that you were not hired to do. You were told to do things. But you know that if you want to keep your job, you've got to do it. And if you make a stand, you might have nothing. Well, here, these servants would only do what they were paid to do. And people would lose their sheep because they fell off the side of the road. They'd do their plowing and all of a sudden they came up with rocks. That's not my job to dig the rocks up. I can't plow. I'm done for the day. I only did my duty. Here we're seeing as worthy servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, are we doing more? And that's our challenge. That's my challenge to you today to see, all right, first of all, are you being a faithful servant? If you're not, toe the line. If you are, see what more you could be done. And I'm not asking for more in this church. I'm asking for more in your life. Your blessings will go around you. And if you come in this door, you will bless the people who are here, which in turn will bless this church. Will you bless your family, your co-workers, your friends, the people you go to the grocery store with and continue to do business there and not go to another spot? Start with yourself and ask the question, how can I do more? And in that challenge, see what the Lord will do for you. See what more can happen and how more you can be blessed. We're doing some work in the parsonage. The, the end is in sight. Discovering new problems at the end is in sight. We'll have a tour when it's all done, and you can come in and look at it, see what it looks like now. If you need to come in now just to look at it, that's fine. You can walk in, see the construction mess, that's fine. Uh, and, and then you can see how it becomes, that's fine. But we're, we're in the process of, of working. We finished that house. We almost finished the other one. We discovered a gas leak in the foundation, and so we had to 
change lines. It was a headache. TJ's been breaking his back and other body parts in the process of doing this. So thank you for your help. Uh, we've had some contractors come in and demo is one thing you don't need a contractor for. You just get a hammer and start busting things. <laughs> and so we've been busting things in and then having the specialists come. It's been a process, but I tell you, yeah, it's a roof, but there's definitely something more that could have been found in it. And when you find mold, that's not something to be content in. We're going to clean this up. We're going to get rid of it. And we're going to find a way to get something new. And some of our lives, if we start cleaning around the edges, we might find a little bit of mold. You, it might be there. Let's try to clean up a little bit. See what more we can fill into our lives, our cups, so that we are overflowing. And you're going to be like the disciples. And you're going to say, increase our faith. Because what more can be done? Well, you can find a way to forgive someone. You can find a way in your heart that this person who is, you, you, you get to rebuke them. Keep that in mind. You get to rebuke them. But if they turn, you have the obligation to forgive them. And that's where our faith, as it strengthens, it will allow us to do it. And then we will be filled with the Spirit of God in a way that we can change the world. And as Lexi asked for prayer for the world in the beginning here, it's important to know that we can change the world. We just need to be filled with the Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together and we thank you for your words. And as some of these might be a little hard for us to fathom, we ask that you would give us your direction and help us to understand it a little better. Lord, as we are challenged with the world around us, may we find a way to love them. May we find a way to love you. We ask that your spirit would speak to us continually so that our faith might be increased. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.